Now, in the days of Hoover, it was a kind of a disastrous time. Now, what happened, we uh, didn't make very much crop. And what crop we made, the bottom fell out into the way. It just wasn't worth nothing. Broom corn, one crop was cut for seven and a half cents an hour. I've cashed many a check for a fellow that worked 10 hours cutting broom corn. Got a check for 75 cents. People lost their farms. I mean, good, rich farms. They lost them. My uncle was a banker, and he foreclosed on a lot of good farms. But he had to do it because the banking commissioner told him to do it or to close the bank. With hard times, even law and order in America seemed threatened. If you needed proof, it was pretty boy Floyd. If you gather round me children, a story I will tell. Pretty boy Floyd an outlaw. Oklahoma knew him well. He was an outlaw, a robber, and a killer. But in Depression America, Charles Pretty Boy Floyd became a kind of hero, celebrated in movies and song for helping the poor. He was in Oklahoma City. It was on a Christmas day. There come a whole car load of groceries with a letter that did say well, you say that I'm an outlaw, you say that I'm a thief. Here's Christmas dinner for the families on relief. My father was uh, with, with my mother and I when I was born. But after that, uh, it was only about a year, I think, after that he was put in prison. And the first time I ever saw him, I was probably about five, maybe five and a half years old. He impressed me because he was so well-dressed and he looked so nice and everything, you know, I thought he looked like a movie star. They called Floyd the sagebrush Robin Hood because he generously rewarded those who helped him escape the law, all part of the desperation of hard times. There was a lot of stealing, you know, steal someone's hogs and butcher them. And so there was a lot of uh, that sort of thing going on because of people being hungry. And, of course, I think... A lot of that was overlooked by the uh, enforcement authorities because they realized it was a matter of person eating. Floyd was the son of tenant farmers who had struggled to escape poverty and debt. At age 20, he turned his back on farm life, robbed a St. Louis grocery store payroll, was caught, and spent three and a half... children to the field and have them on the sack with you, or drag them on the sack and let them play up the middles and they'd pick little piles of cotton and I'd pick it up when I got to it. But I was with my children all the time. Those cotton sacks were vicious things. They were, they, they would hold uh, maybe two or three hundred pounds of hand-picked cotton and you'd pull it across on your shoulder, up and down the cotton row, stooping over all the time. Once picked, cotton found few buyers. For corn and wheat, the situation was no better. Throughout the 1920s, farmers had expanded, going into debt to buy new machinery and land. My father did a lot of puzzling about it because it was high, $400 an acre. But the bankers, the bankers in the community said, Oh, Herman, you better buy now because next year it'll be at least $100 higher. By the 1930s, overproduction had created a crisis. Low prices did not even repay the cost of raising crops, let alone 
the interest farmers owed on borrowed money. Within a year, the land prices in that community dropped severely. In fact, it would have been difficult, even if it had been possible to sell, to get anything more than $100 an acre for what we'd paid $400 an acre for just 12 months before that. Then, in 1930, America's agricultural heartland was struck by drought. Cool masses of air have not flown southward as usually to cool it, nor moist airs from the ocean to bring us rainfall. See, we went there for months on end without rain. And uh, in July of 1930, we had every day was 100 degrees or more. Corn and the cotton and the garden stuff and everything just dried up, turned yellow and died. The drought threatened to leave poor tenant farmers and sharecroppers without food or money to make it through the winter. In Washington, President Hoover turned to the nation's leading agency for disaster relief, the Red Cross. Mr. President, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to ask you to enroll... Mr. Hoover was sort of the spiritual godfather of the American Red Cross. Still is. And uh, he, he believed that people ought to help each other. Those that uh, had it should spread it around and shouldn't charge for it. My grandmother and grandfather were uh, Quakers, uh, and uh, it just was a normal thing to, to uh, do good deeds, but you shouldn't call attention to it. People would turn to the Red Cross for all kinds of help, and the senators or politicians, Washington, worked through the Red Cross, and they became an agency almost of a political nature. In the drought area, the Red Cross began by distributing garden seeds so that people could grow food for the coming winter. The Red Cross gave out seeds, and uh, when we went for them, we got peas, we got turnip seed, collard seed, everything that belonged in a garden, even got eggplants. I didn't know anything about eggplants until the Red Cross issued those eggplant seeds. Drought wore on. Even the Red Cross gardens died. By September, many sharecroppers and wage laborers were hungry. But planters feared that further relief would keep people from working. And they blocked Red Cross efforts until the cotton was picked. Not until late November did food distribution begin. The Red Cross went into the furniture stores here and told them, says, you sell these people the groceries you've got in here and we'll pay you for them. But we're not going to give them money because they'll throw it away or drunk, drink whiskey with it and everything. In most counties, the Red Cross worked within the plantation system and relied on the landowners to determine who got food. Your boss man, he would already go in front and he'd be untold how many families he had on his place that needed aid. And so when you got out there, they would uh, check each individual that was drawing for a household. Dear Red Cross, my children need books and clothes so they can go to school. If my mules don't die this winter and I can get something for them to eat, I'm going to try to make a crop here next year. I don't want the Red Cross to give me nothing. But if you'll help me and give me time, I'll pay you for all that you do for me. Signed, A.C. Blount. In Arkansas, the state hardest hit by drought, the agricultural crisis closed one quarter of the banks. Red Cross relief money was frozen. As aid ran out, people faced starvation. I look back at myself now and am surprised at how little awareness there seemed to be in Washington of what was going on around the country. Opinion in the newspapers was pretty much Republican. 
and it was in the interest of the Republican owners of the newspapers to play down bad news about the state of the economy and play up good news because bad news would suggest that there was something wrong with the Hoover administration. The president insisted private charity could meet the crises. He denied anyone was starving because of the drought. An open letter to President Hoover to say that people are not suffering of hunger and actually starving in Arkansas is a blind denial of plain facts. The Red Cross and the states that are stricken have not the resources to meet the situation. As an American citizen and as a soldier in the late World War, I am utterly disgusted to think it probable that my national government should shirk its inescapable duty in this time of peril. Respectfully, Oliver Moore. In December of 1930, the drought produced what Hoover had fought to avoid, a call for the federal government to feed people. He thought people should work and um, n not get on the dole. He thought that, that really demoralized people. He felt that the soul's growth depended on uh, your self-reliance and pride in your self-reliance. And uh, once you start uh, giving up and asking aid from someone else, uh, you've given up the fight. You've given up the, the reason to live. With the Red Cross overwhelmed, Arkansas's Democratic Senator Joseph T. Robinson now sought $60 million in federal aid. Hoover threatened to veto any legislation that gave direct federal aid to individuals. The bill he signed authorized loans of $45 million for seed and animal feed. It made no mention of food. Mr. Hoover was at best, or at worst, very, very conservative. And he never had missed any meals, neither had his wife. And, and, and nothing changes your attitude like going hungry a couple of days and he never had had that and he just couldn't believe that there were people in his under his administration that were not eating regular winter deepened shortages increased across the drought states the gas company sent a man out to turn off the gas in a house where a woman and a number of children lived and uh, when he arrived, she was unable to pay the bill. He, he, she said, please give me time to finish cooking. He said, no, I, my instructions are to turn it off right away. And he she went into where she was cooking. And to his horror, he saw in a basket the head of a dog. And then realized that she was cooking a dog for the children as the only food she had in the house. just come on us that we didn't have nothing to go on. Winter time coming and didn't have anything from the summer. You get hungry. You get real antsy. Anybody does. And uh, you, you get a feeling that the that, uh, world's going to hell in a handbasket and you can't position yourself in such a world. By the end of the year, 150,000 Arkansas families were in danger of starving. On January 3rd, 1931, in the countryside around the town of England, Arkansas, Red Cross distribution had completely broken down. No food had been handed out for three days. Journalist Lament Harris asked Homer Coney, one of the desperate farmers, to describe that winter day. And he says, I was here, and I was in the same condition as about everybody else. And all of a sudden, a woman comes up, and she says, Coney, the kids hate that for three days. What'll I do? And Coney said, Something went right up in my head, and I says, you stay here, I'll get food for you. And we drove over to 
a neighbor's house where the Red Cross was supposed to operate, and there were people hanging around there, waiting. And I got up in the truck, and I said, listen to me, we're hungry. If you aren't yaller, come with me, and we'll go to town and we'll get food. 500 farmers marched into town with Coney and confronted a prominent lawyer about their Red Cross supplies. And Coney said, I got right up on the truck. I wasn't going to hide or crawl under a car or anything. I let everybody see me. And I said, all right, we we'll give you the half hour, but we got to have what we came for. And Lawyer Morris says he got on the telephone and he called up Little Rock, Arkansas, the capital, Red Cross. And he says, look, the farmers are in town, hundreds of them. If you don't give us authorization, they're going to take the food. All right, we authorize. So they authorize $2.50 worth of food for everybody. We took it, and we went home. Though the confrontation had been peaceful, newspapers around the country called it a riot. It was the kind of thing the newspapers couldn't ignore. And in the secret hearts of a lot of our leaders, community leaders, uh, throughout the South, throughout the Midwest, was this feeling that we're on the edge of something and we don't want to get it started here at home. The Red Cross increased efforts in the drought area, including a new school lunch program. But the nation now knew that private charity was being overwhelmed by the combination of drought and depression. In 1931, as prices continued to fall, the entire farm economy approached collapse. Went to the bank to borrow some money. Tell you right now, didn't find it funny. The banker said he had none to loan. Get your old hat and pull out home. For all I got gone, all I got gone. There was a terrific amount of anguish and uh, trauma on, on three sides. Well, one from the bankers themselves who could not meet the demands of their depositors. There was anguish on the part of uh, depositors who could not get their money out, and there was anguish on the part of farmers, especially, who were beginning to lose their, their farm because of not being able to pay, and pretty soon it became a calamity. Even Betty Boop lost her farm, as thousands of mortgages were called in by the banks. It seemed that all America was for sale. There was considerable bitterness. The feeling against bankers turned from, well, this is the man we ought to listen to, to this is a person that hasn't done us any good. Now it's through this world I ramble. I see lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a thick gun. Some with a fountain pen. Well, they needed a hero about that. You know, the banks were uh, going uh, under and taking people's money and foreclosing on farms and everything. And I think that uh, the people felt that my father was just uh, one of them uh, kind of striking back for all of them. From 1929 to 1931, as the economic crisis deepened, bank robberies increased dramatically. There had been so many bank robberies around that it was quite often that a customer would come in and jokingly say, this is a holdup. And uh, so I happened to have my back to the counter at the moment, and this fellow hollered, this is a holdup. And I said, oh, yeah. Turned around, and sure enough, the gun was right in my face. Most of them were small robberies. By, by that I mean they were small banks. And, uh, of course, it was kind of a disgrace to get robbed by anybody except a pretty boy Floyd. Floyd was a wanted man in states across America's farm belt. But in the small towns where he robbed banks, farmers talked to Floyd tearing up mortgages and giving money to the poor. Charles Pretty Boy Floyd was becoming a legend. There's a mini a star 
starving farmers The same old story told How this outlaw paid their mortgage And saved their little home Charlie came to our house. Now, this is my first remembrance of him. He came to our house, and Mother was telling him about a family that lived out the edge of town. Mother said, well, this family out there really needs some help. You know, the kids don't even have shoes. So it's good. He said, well, why don't let's get some groceries, or Mother said that. They agreed together they were going to get groceries. So they, Mother said, well, Ruth knows the way. I crawled in there and showed Charlie how to go out to their farmhouse. So Charlie gets out of the car and puts the basket of groceries on the porch. And then he gave me a bill and put it in my hand. And he said, Dink, I was tiny then, he called me Dinky. But he said, Dink, give this man this bill and tell him to buy his children some shoes. Pretty boy Floyd and outlaw. Oklahoma knew him well. Floyd was frankly a little smarter than most of the average bank robbers to where he would uh, move out of the one area and he would hit maybe a hundred miles away. In 1931, Pretty Boy Floyd embarked on a robbing spree that took him from Oklahoma through Missouri east to Ohio and then home to Oklahoma where Floyd knew that for a few dollars a poor farm family would gladly hide him out. In five months Floyd stole more than $12,000. We used to hear about Pretty Boy Floyd. There were some other outlaws. I can't think of their names now. Most of we had to talk about We talk about that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> get a lot of fun out of it. They'd follow his escapades in the paper, you know, and it was kind of like uh, they, they were pulling for him to stay at large instead of being killed. Hello, Louis. Depression America was fascinated by the underworld. Outlaws and gangsters on the screen and on the streets seemed unstoppable. In Oklahoma, which led the nation in bank robberies in 1932, officials appealed to the citizens to turn in Pretty Boy Floyd, who was accused of six killings and ten robberies. He really didn't spend all that money that he robbed. To him, I think it began to be a game in the beginning, and then it got more serious, you know. In early 1932, Oklahoma bankers intensified efforts to capture Floyd. They hired Irv Kelly, a retired sheriff, to lead the manhunt. Floyd's wife had moved down to live with her parents, and the telephone operator let my father know that Floyd had been calling his wife and Floyd had told her he was coming and that was the uh, way that they were able to set up the trap. It was in nighttime and Irv Kelly and some more people were staked out and in those days you had gates to keep the stock in and somebody had to stop and open the gate to go into where we live. We live back in the field. Along about two o'clock in the morning it got quite cold and the fellows at this one end of the road that they thought Floyd would come in decided to go into Bigsby, which was two miles, and get some coffee. While all of this was transpiring, Floyd came in through this uh, place where these officers had left. And so my father got out to open the gate, and Earl Kelly stepped out from behind the chicken house. My dad could not be positive that it was Floyd because those officers would have given him a signal if Floyd came through and they were to come up and block, you know, the thing off. So uh, when Floyd, they came up to open the gate and my dad stepped out, then the gun battle started and my dad was killed. <laughs> The killing turned the public against the outlaw pretty boy Floyd. We just heard about it. We don't ever know him coming in here doing anything for anybody in this area. We would just hear about it. They call him a kind of Robin Hood. It's nice to be a Robin Hood, I'm sure. 
But if you come and take my bread when I need it to eat and go give it to somebody else, you're not a Robin Hood to me. Floyd would remain at large for two more years until FBI agents cornered and shot him in an Ohio cornfield. But the crime wave of the early Depression years continued to feed fears that America was coming apart. All I got gone, all I got gone. As agricultural crises and industrial shutdowns accelerated, President Hoover was besieged with demands to aid America's newly poor. Hoover was feeling the pressure. To relieve stress, the White House physician had prescribed a demanding physical regimen. The president and his cabinet worked out on the South Lawn every morning. They called it Hoover Ball. You had to be there at 6 o'clock in the morning. And after they played medicine ball, they'd come in to have this breakfast, which would be uh, 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 grapefruit juice and, and fruit and coffee and whole wheat toast. And uh, well, they talked about the Depression. Oh, that was all, all the most. Uh, that's all they talked about, the Depression. The president and his aides were busy as bird dogs, I say. He had people coming in to see him to talk about the things he needed to get done and to get information. The most positive thing he did about the economic depression that was spreading over the country was the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was founded on the idea that if you could stimulate business at the top, uh, the proceeds would trickle down through the economic layers to the people at the bottom. The idea was not to put purchasing power in the hands of the people at the bottom, but to, uh, to stimulate business and industry. Hoover knew he was seeing Hitler Arches Carvels. Intuition in the talent of New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt. At the breakfast table, the uh, question came uh, about ha uh, his handicap. They were thinking, how can he be president? Roosevelt had contracted polio in 1921 and his legs had been paralyzed. Years of therapy restored little strength to his muscles, a fact which was kept largely hidden from the public by a cooperative press. At the cabinet meeting, they said, it's impossible. Uh, people, when they find out he's only a half man, they'll never elect him as president. But there was one man at the table that spoke up, and that was Justice Stone. Justice Stone says, let's don't uh, rush this thing, because if we say mu much about it, it will kick back on us. And he says, and he'll be standing at the podium, and says, he could stand there for hours. And he says he has a magnificent, warm smile and a voice that radiates with sincerity. With a new media of communication, he can be mighty impressive. President Hoover never said a word. Just never said one word. In the spring of 1932, an army of the poor and unemployed posed a new threat to Hoover's presidency. Veterans of the First World War these men would build a movement that would shake the faith of many Americans in their government. The campaign began when ex-Army Sergeant Walter Waters led 300 veterans out of Portland, Oregon. Their goal? To claim a bonus for their military service. Congress had promised to pay the bonus in 1945, but the veterans wanted their money now. Other veterans hearing of the bonus army, also began moving toward the capital. If there was a bonus army going to Washington, D.C., my dad wouldn't miss it for the world. He was very um, anti uh, the Hoover administration and the trickle-down economy of that particular era. We would drive to the outskirts of uh, town, and then we would march through the town with our signs and so forth. And um, uh, my brother and I and several other children, we held the large American flag in our hands, open, spread out like a spread, and the townspeople threw nickels and dimes uh, into the flag. And um, that was the funding for uh, food and gasoline. Uh, my uncle, uh, Sam, uh, was the uh, first in our family to ever uh, go east to the nation's capital because he felt compelled to uh, see that the bonus was paid off. We went down there with carloads of 
trucks come from all over the country. Guys with no shoes on, ragged down clothes. I remember one family who had come all the way from California. Their home was taken away from them, and they had put into the car everything they could carry, including the jelly the wife had put up. And they used the jelly to um, uh, pay the toll charges. who marched on Washington and went home, the veterans planned to stay until a new bonus bill became law. A few blocks from the Capitol, along Pennsylvania Avenue, the veterans took over a group of abandoned buildings. And they set up housekeeping in the floors without any walls. Uh, and of course that made a somewhat unsightly appearance. As the veterans outgrew the camps near the Capitol, the Washington police sent them outside the city to the mud flats along the Anacostia River. In case of riot, the police knew they could close the bridge to Anacostia and keep the veterans out of downtown Washington. With more veterans arriving every day, Secretary of War Patrick Hurley and Army Chief of Staff General Douglas MacArthur ordered tanks to move closer to the city. At the White House, the Secret Service requested that troops be prepared to defend the president at a moment's notice. The president had suggested that why not send army kitchens over and feed them. Well, the cabinet, and especially the, the Hurley of the War Department, said that would be accommodating him, and we would just get more and more and more and more. And of course, that went around the table. Hoover authorized delivery of medical supplies and surplus army equipment to the bonus camps, though he allowed no publicity about this aid. I remember moving into the tent city, and, um, and then we had a large tent that was ours, and we had army cots in the tent to sleep on, and we had army blankets. Uh, I don't know where they got all of these provisions from. There were field kitchens where they cooked for the men who were by themselves. Of course, my mother cooked for us, and... Uh, be a lot of soup, I know, because you had a lot of miles to feed, so there, there was plenty of soup. At the end of May, Walter Waters officially took command of the Bonus Army in Washington. Keeping order in the camps, whose residents now numbered more than 3,000, was the responsibility of the city police force. I went on the police department at a salary of $1,900 a year and in two months after on the police department they cut us ten percent but I was drawing a check every two weeks and there was millions of people in the United States that was not drawing that I was happy I was ecstatic I could pay for my clothes I could buy my motorcycle shoes that I had to buy uh, other people couldn't do this but for these people that made these marchers it was terrific in early June Communist organizers around the country announced that the bonus march had been their idea. Although there were never more than 200 communists in the bonus army, their presence in Washington worried many in the government. The veterans are badly advised and badly led in marching upon Washington to collect a debt which is not due at this time and which the Congress does not propose to be coerced by any groups, veteran or any other, into voting a bonus bill in the present session of Congress. The bonus would cost more than the government would take in that year. Committed to a balanced budget, Hoover asked the Senate to save the country from what he called the road to ruin. In your hands at this moment is the answer to the question whether democracy has the capacity to speedily enough to act speedily enough to save itself in emergency. We're asking for the payment of a just and honest debt. 
it will be a godsend to this nation because the nation needs the additional purchasing power which this bill will afford. The bonus bill faced stiff opposition. Some feared it would divert money from more urgent depression measures. But the veterans lobbied hard. On June 15th, they moved one step closer to victory when the House of Representatives passed the bonus bill. Seven, three cheers for the bonus that we're going to get. I don't think Washington really understood what had happened in the country until you got the bonus marches coming there and lobbying the Congress every day and settling into uh, makeshift dwellings all around the Capitol. That was what brought the Depression home to government. Now the veterans turned out to push the bonus through the Senate. But just two days after the victory in the House, the Senate voted to kill the bill. The news stunned the crowd. I remember walking down that long flight of steps from the Senate building and seeing thousands of people milling about. I think there was probably a sense of great confusion. I come all the way from California or Arkansas to try to get the bonus award and so I can feed my kids. And Senate hasn't done anything about it. What do we do now? Where was it that you came to Washington? Why to beat the undertaker, spend the money before the undertaker gets it. I came to Washington to get my bonus, and I'm going to wait for it till I get it if I have to wait till 1945. Senator Gore, my grandfather, didn't believe in giving anybody anything, so he was opposed to the bonus. I went with my grandfather from his house in Rock Creek Park. He had a big, long, black Packard car and a driver called Davis, and I sat in the back of the car as we drove down Pennsylvania Avenue on both sides for the bonus army. As we approached the Senate side of the Capitol, they recognized Senator Gore, and they began to stone the car. And from that moment on, I knew that it could happen here, and that one day we might indeed have a revolution, and it would be rich against poor. The veterans were determined to force Congress to reconsider. Over the next few weeks, as the government watched with concern, the population of the camps increased to over 20,000. Anacostia became the nation's most famous Hooverville. I'm just a poor ex soldier that broke and On assignment for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Roy Wilkins visited Anacostia and found black and white vets living side by side, although Washington and the U.S. military were still strictly segregated. There was a sort of a leveling process as these people got together, and there was a sense of solidarity and a sense of responsibility to give a good account of themselves. They tried to give little homey touches to the hovels they lived in, uh, some of them were built of, of cardboard, some of um, tin sheeting, some of wood, um, and a number of them had planted little gardens. The Bonus Army had occupied Washington for more than two months. With Congress scheduled to adjourn, the veterans mounted a final protest. For more than three days, they marched in front of the Capitol in slow, shuffling relays of tired men. The Washington Press called it a death march. The atmosphere around the Capitol building was very strange during the death march. There was a, a sense of, of sadness, of desperation. The thing we couldn't forget was that um, the pavement was so hot, and with these bare feet, it must have been a very painful thing. We were practically begging for our money. As the vigil wore on, official Washington began to feel under siege. We drove through Washington as fast as we could. We didn't, we didn't feel comfortable stopping at stop sign, especially along Pennsylvania Avenue. And I had to cross Pennsylvania Avenue to get into the White House. And we rolled up our windows and locked our doors, and uh, 
Well, it was a ragtag bunch of people. It was a mess there in Washington, and we weren't happy about it one bit. Tradition called for the president to come to Capitol Hill and close Congress. As the Senate debated on its last day, Hoover's limousine waited. It was a dramatic moment, on the one hand, where the Congress, with the power to make or break some of these people, there was a president who sat in his well-guarded White House. The streets were cut off, were taped off. All in favor say aye. Fearful for the president's safety, the Secret Service did not let Hoover come to the Capitol. A few minutes before midnight, Congress adjourned without reconsidering the bonus bill. Members of Congress left through underground tunnels to avoid the veterans waiting outside. Take it from me, this is the greatest demonstration of Americanism we've ever had. Pure Americanism. Willing to take this beating as you've taken it. Stand right steady. You keep every law. And why in the hell shouldn't you? Who in the hell yeah, has done all the bleeding for this country and for this law and, and this Constitution anyhow for two fellows? But don't, don't take a step back. But remember, as soon as you haul down your camp flag here and clear out this thing, every one of you clears out, this evaporates in thin air. And all this struggle will have been no good. Washington authorities wanted their city back. Twelve days after Congress adjourned, the district commissioners ordered police to evict the veterans from the buildings on Pennsylvania Avenue. One thousand angry veterans poured across the bridge from the main camp at Anacostia into downtown. We had no uh, uh, training, special training to handle riots. Veterans refused to move. They got bricks and started throwing at the policemen. Several of the policemen were hurt, and some of the policemen picked up bricks and threw them back at the veterans. Then the police opened fire. One veteran was killed. Another lay dying. City commissioners now requested that the president call out the military. By 4 o'clock, army troops were in position behind the White House. I had a press card, and I used it to get through the police line. And uh, I saw advancing towards us some cavalry, some marching troops, a couple of not too formidable whippet tanks. And I suddenly realized that the uh, commander was the chief of staff of the United States at the time, General MacArthur. And that uh, assisting him were two majors, Major George Patton, and the other was Major Dwight D. Eisenhower. The uh, cavalry men pulled their sabers out of their scabbards. The, the troops fixed bayonets. I heard a bugle sound, and they all drew their sabers and then another bugle sound, and they started, the whole line started forward at a walk. MacArthur's orders from Hoover were to surround the area on Pennsylvania Avenue and clear it without delay. In violation of those orders, MacArthur began to clear the entire city of the bonus army. Here were young fellows, of course a lot younger than most of the veterans, were charged with going out and and actually using force against people that had fought for the United States in World War I. The men who had been under fire in Europe, and this was nothing new to them, kept the proper distance, and when a canister of tear gas would be thrown, part of the time they'd throw it back. It was a, a feeling of frustration. You wanted to help both of them. You know, you couldn't do anything. It was something that uh, I'll never forget. I happened to be near General MacArthur, and I saw him speak to a sergeant, and then I saw the sergeant uh, collect a squad and then go down the row of, of uh, ramshackle huts, and they'd throw a wad of newspaper into a corner of a hut and set that alight. They went right down the whole row that way. 
and pretty soon the whole row was burning. While MacArthur's troops mopped up downtown, three of his tanks held the bridge leading to Anacostia. Trapped inside the camp with the veterans were 600 of their wives and children. My father was away in the tent. Uh, came back and uh, told my mother that they were, they were going to march on the capital. He's going to march in force. And, uh, of course, my mother was a little upset about it. When we started across the bridge and I uh, saw these soldiers, and I've never seen tanks and soldiers on horses and soldiers with bayonets before. And uh, so, uh, and my father was pretty headstrong. I didn't know whether he was going to try to go through them or not, but uh, it, uh, it was frightening. Yeah, I remember very well. It was uh, something I'll never forget. Twice that night, Hoover ordered MacArthur not to cross into Anacostia, but the general chose to ignore presidential authority. A few minutes after 11 p.m., he sent his troops across the bridge. By midnight, all of Washington could see Anacostia burning. What had gone on reinforced my feeling that it was too bad that the richest country in the world couldn't do a better job of caring for its own people. I just thought America didn't give a very good account of itself that night. While the ruins of Anacostia smoldered, bonus marchers filled the roads leaving the capital. As the men retreated, General MacArthur reported that the veterans had intended to take over the government. Although MacArthur had violated direct orders, President Hoover took full responsibility for the eviction of the Bonus Army. In Albany, New York, Franklin Roosevelt, the Democratic candidate for president, listened to radio reports of the rout and told his aide he thought Hoover had already lost the election. The next morning at the breakfast table, the president was very much upset. And he said uh, uh, to the cabinet, he says, uh, I, I, I know there's no way we can explain to the American people what happened yesterday. Why did we have to use so much force against unarmed veterans? He says, why did we have to do that? He says, I know the, the Democrats are laughing themselves to death. Roosevelt waged a strenuous campaign. Though his platform was vague, he suggested that his new deal for the American people would make government more responsive to the suffering caused by the Depression. President Hoover remained opposed to increased demands upon the federal government. What our people need is the restoration of their normal jobs, the recovery of agricultural prices, and the business. A lot of people were out of work, and they weren't happy at all with the president. They blamed it all on him. And they took us after the speech was over and rushed us back to the train. It was ugly. It was ugly. They were screaming, and they were shaking their fists at us, and we were frightened. I know the Secret Service men were frightened, too, for the president. It was a very anxious time. As Hoover's campaign arrived in Iowa, more than 6,000 farms were in foreclosure. With Americans preparing to go to the polls, the head of the Farmers Union predicted, unless the president elected gives farmers relief, he will be the last president of the United States. These forces that I saw developing, coming from the heart of America, the unemployed farmers who used to have real farms and were in danger of losing them, and the bonus marchers, all were rising up and making their feelings and demands felt, and it really did 
usher in a uh, new state of affairs. Franklin Roosevelt, promising to restore this country to prosperity, won a landslide victory. In private that night, as his son James helped remove his braces, FDR confessed he was afraid. All my life, the president-elect said, I have been afraid of only one thing, fire. Tonight, I think I'm afraid of something else. I'm afraid that I may not have the strength to do this job. Roosevelt's son made no reply, and then his father added, After you leave me tonight, I am going to pray that God will give me the strength to do this job and to do it right. I hope you will pray for me too.